And good morning, everybody. Uh, honorable audience, uh, I'm very kind to be here learning about different experience and different views of the cultural diplomacy. Uh, from my first words, I wish to convey a cordial and friendly message from a small country where I come from. A small in territorial dimensions, although great in its permanent effort for contributing to peace and harmony on the nations. The Republic of Panama has a long-standing tradition of collaboration on international forums. By means of initiative and additions to conventions, multilateral treaties, and bilateral documents with its significant number of developed and developing nations, always with respect for the dignity of those countries that comprise the five continents. Given that, I won't go into philosophy arguments, that's not my specialty, and as to involve myself and express in those deep things, and in a select and appropriate reasoning that might be in keeping with the intellectual level and depth of thought of the distinguished personalities present in this forum. I will limit my participation to describe the aspect of Panama's reality in relation to this subject matter. If we understand culture as the particular identity that arises from the convergence of all the material and spiritual things created by the human being that differ differentiates the different people of the world. We must conclude that the geographical area and physical and spiritual characteristics of those human groups are determining factors in their delayed or progressive actions. <clears throat> History also proves that every attempt at solving a conflict by plundering or severely damaging the adversary's cultural identity, regardless of whether it is a small body of people, come with a high price. If in this venue we can generate a cultural diplomacy-based work, study and action, actions, metrics differentiated from the state, although not necessarily set up against it, we can hope that the gathering of civilization may substitute the clash and that in any case we may pay a lower price than that paid for arriving at where we are now. A privileged work, story and action niches is now available, which will exceptionally support and complement state diplomacy in the cultural sphere, especially in times of crisis, but which should endeavor to develop an autonomous and alternative space of empowered cultural diplomacy so that all, without compulsion, without prejudice, and without fear, may undertake that marvelous exercise of tolerance vis-a-vis -vis diversity. Our history has been writing with wisdom, patience, and love for others and for ourselves by clearing the path in the land that saw us come to life so that all may cross over and all may communicate. The Universal, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights signed on December 10, 1948, arose as a result of a sorrowful experience of international conflicts. The Panamanian researcher and analyst, Robert Montañez, in an interesting document entitled, The Balance of the Past 65 Years of Enforcement of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, published in the newspaper La Prensa on December 9, 1213, says as follows. 
In this process of preparation of the humanitarian doctrine, Panama made its contribution as report in the records of the Minister of Foreign Relations, an historical event dated April 1945, is highlighted therein, namely, when the UN General Assembly gathered in San Francisco, received Panama's draft, which was prepared by Dr. Ricardo J. Alfaro. It was a document consisting of 18 brief articles drafted with juridical clarity and accuracy providing for the essential rights for which humanity and struggle for seven centuries. This initiative by Dr. Alfaro emphasized respect for freedom of religion, opinion, speech, gathering, association, release from unfair interference, impartial justice, prohibition of arbitrary detentions, retroactivity of the law, right of property, education, labor, working conditions, etc. And the distinguished researcher goes on to say, the Economic and Social Council created the Human Rights Commission in 1946 and entrusted the former First Lady of the United States, Eleanor Roosevelt, the preparation of a draft declaration providing the freedom, freedom, justice, and peace, which principle imply the recognition at the universal level of the intrinsic dignity and equal and inalienable rights of all the members of the human family. The document was complemented in 1966 through the adoption of two agreements, one on economic social and cultural rights, and the other on civil and political rights. All of our nation history has been and will continue to be focused on the geographical characteristics of the isthmus and the geopolitical and commercial importance which all nations have and continue to attribute to its function as a site of transit. We are a crossing point, and above all, we Panamanians have made it a meeting point. Day in and day out, in my country, people of multiple cultural identities express their fervent prayers in very different languages to different deities. Throughout the hours of every day, the ports of the most varied cultures of the world communicate and interact with each other by means of the Panamanian Isthmus. In Panama, hundreds of thousands of persons belonging to the most varied cultures do not interact, but rather peacefully coexist. Our culture, our personality, the characteristic of our economy, as well as the level of the freedom and independence within which we have developed as a nation and political entity are related in a complex and dialectical manner to that geographical accident and the cultural identity we have developed around it. Its influence is powerful and of a double nature. One, on the one hand, our prosperity and security has depended, depend and will continue to depend on our relations with the rest of the world and in particular on the condition under which the interoceanic transit and trade between the most powerful nations of the world is peacefully carried out. That is how we contribute so that the United States and China, Asia and Europe, South, Central and North America, Russia and Brazil may come together and put out each other's hand. To this end, we declare and agree on a system of neutrality of the interoceanic way and the Panamanian territory that benefit all. On the other hand, the interest of the other countries in the interoceanic path imply restrictions and potential threats to our territorial integrity, to the preservation of our cultural identity, to our national and international behavior, our decision-making capacity with respect 
to our resource as well as our capacity to benefit from the geographical area. In this context, the Torrijos Carter treaties, the model of a cultural diplomacy based on the voluntary unempowerment of the, of the strongest on giving back to Panama full freedom and the administration of the canal, agreeing in, on the total interoceanic canal with its adjacent area has opened a new stage for world trade, which is further strengthened with expansion currently in place, thus ending a sorrowful stage and relaunching our relation with the United States, with the other states on the international community, and in particular, with the user of the interoceanic path. This new reality coupled with the process of globalization and commercial opening create the condition for the qualitative leap in our foreign policy in view of its new responsibilities. It is a undeniable fact that the transfer of the canal, its expansion, and demilitarization has further given to Panama great geopolitical weights. Active participation in the international community's life is imperative in order to guarantee our independence and preserve control and management of the waterway. Therefore, in accepting your invitation, we would like to say that we are interested in attesting to the fact that the that an empowered culture diplomacy might make a difference between the solution that resorts to violence <clears throat> and the one based on understanding and recognition of the rights of individuals as words of a specific cultural identity. This treaty did not only do justice to the collectivity called Panama, rather it was done over all who li live in this territory where more or not here, who benefit just as the rest of the world through what we do. It is for this reason that Panama coat arm bears the description promundi beneficio. I conclude, honorable and distinguished participant, in my capacity of former Vice President of Panama, that I will spare no efforts so that Panama may maintain a state policy in its foreign relations the non-changeable route for achieving the ideal of harmony, progress, and peace among all nations. Thank you for your kind assistance and for your invitation to this most productive forum.